The title of this lecture is Fantastic Fats because that's what they are. They're fantastic. They're an essential nutrient in the human body, but there are some fats, as Eudo Erasmus's book title states, there are fats that kill and there are fats that heal. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like, you to sh I'd like to show you the molecular structure of the fat. When you understand the molecular structure of the fats, then you know what they do. And then you know what the body does with them and then you understand the effect that they have on the body. This is the 18 chain fatty acid that makes up omega-3 which is found in its highest sources in flaxseed and chia seed. I'm going to show you what that omega-3 is. It's an 18 chain fatty acid, meaning that there are 18 chains in that fatty acid link and there are hydrogen atoms either side, that's the H, and in the middle they're linked by carbon atoms. There are 19 trillion of those in one drop of oil, so that's the magnification we're looking at. What does the three mean? The three indicates the position on this fatty acid chain of the first double bond. What's a double bond? Well, let's, let's count it up first. One, two, three, there's the double bond. A double bond indicates that instead of one link, there's two links. And whenever you get this double bond, these two hydrogen atoms are gone. And these two hydrogen atoms develop an electromagnetic field between them and start repelling each other. In flaxseed, chia seed, there are three double bonds. So we've got one, two, three, another one here, one, two, another one here. So these two hydrogen atoms are gone and these two develop an electromagnetic field between them. And that changes the structure of the oil. The oil now has three kinks in it. And as a result, it's a very thin oil, it's a very fluid oil because it's got these three kinks in it causing those hydrogen atoms to, to, to move apart, causing kinks in the, in the chain. So this oil, omega-3, found in flaxseed and chia seed, is given the name super unsaturated. Why is it unsaturated? Because there are three empty spots on the fatty acid chain. It's a poly unsaturated. Poly meaning more than one double bond. That's what the polyunsaturated means. Poly means more than one double bond. Unsaturated means that there are empty spots on the fatty acid chain. Let's have a look at the effect that these double bonds have on the body. Number one, they create an electromagnetic field between them. That electromagnetic field is very important because we are electrical people. There's a spark of electricity in every cell in the body. Our electrical system is our nervous system. So omega-3 is essential for proper brain function. Double bonds are also light sensitive. That means they attract the light. They are heat sensitive. They attract the heat. And they act like a magnet to oxygen. So when you eat this food, you ensure your electromagnetic field balance. You can absorb more light, more vitamin D. You can manage your heat better and you absorb more oxygen. Cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen, so it makes a lot of sense to include these foods in our daily diet. What are we told is the highest source of omega-3? Fish oil? No animal can put omega-3 into their fatty acid chain. Only plants can. So why are fish high? They eat a one-celled algae that is high. We don't need to eat the one-celled algae. We can eat flaxseed and chia seed. But let me introduce you to the omega-3 family. The omega-3 found in flaxseed, chia seed, is called alpha-linolenic acid. Let's look at the omega-3 family. ALA, alpha-linolenic acid. It has three double bonds in it. So it's quite a fluid oil, one, two, three. In the body, ALA is converted to EPA, epicetionic acid, and it has five double bonds. One, two, three, four, five. 
In the body, EPA is converted to DHA, and DHA has six double bonds. One, two, three, four, five, six. Very fluid oil, and that oil is used exclusively by the body for cell membrane function and repair. In the fish, ALA is eaten in that one-celled algae. In the fish, ALA is converted to EPA. In the fish, EPA is converted to DHA. Then man comes along and extracts the DHA out and says this is a far superior omega-3 because the DHA is already available for your body. But if three double bonds is sensitive to light, heat and oxygen, how sensitive is six double bonds? And the fish that are highest in DHA are also the highest in mercury. And where's mercury found? It's a fat-soluble toxin in the fat. Is it possible to extract not only the six double bonds without destroying it with exposure to that, but is it possible to extract it and not extract the mercury? I think it's far safer to have flaxseed and chia seed. And when you only eat omega-3 in its DHA form, you're actually not getting the ALA and the EPA, which are also used in different body functions. The chia seed is very user-friendly. You can just sprinkle it on everything. <laughs> it can absorb up to 15 times its own weight in fluid, and that starts the breakdown. The flax seed must be ground. It must be ground before you can use it. But don't buy it already ground because in, within about an hour and a half, the light, heat and the oxygen have all been absorbed into those double bonds and the oil is destroyed. That's why if you buy flaxseed oil, it's always in dark tin or bottle in the fridge because the light, heat and the oxygen destroy it. You'll notice at the breakfast table, the last thing to go on the table is the LSA, which is linseed, sunflower and almond. And the first thing to be put away is the LSA. The easiest way is to get a little coffee grinder. There is a use for your coffee grinder. And just grind up as much as you need every morning and sprinkle straight on your breakfast. That's the best way to do it. My suggestion is, especially if you want to take omega-3, for inflammation and how many people that have arthritis are told to go on fish oil. It's because omega-3 is the starting point for the anti-inflammatory chain or cascade in your body. It reduces inflammation. I would have a couple of dessert spoons of chia seed on your breakfast, a couple of dessert spoons on your lunch, maybe you'll also have a couple of dessert spoons of the ground flaxseed. It's the easiest way to take it. Three teaspoons of ground flaxseed will deliver one teaspoon of flaxseed oil. It's a very high oil plant. What about omega-6? Sunflower is high in omega-6. What does the 6 indicate? It indicates the position on the fatty acid chain of the first double bond. One, two, three, four, five, six. There it is there. And sunflower, with its omega-6, has two double bonds. One, two, three, there's another one there. So you've got hydrogen atoms here, you've got hydrogen here, you've got hydrogen atoms here, and you've got hydrogen atoms along here, so you've got two repelling actions. So you've got the oil has got a couple of kinks in it. It's also called a polyunsaturated fatty acid. Poly meaning more than one double bond. Unsaturated, because there are some empty spots on the fatty acid chain. What about olive oil and almond oil? It's high in omega-9, 9 indicating the position on the fatty acid chain of the first double bond. These three are all 18 chain fatty acids. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's the double bond there. There's only one double bond in olive oil and almond oil. So you've got hydrogen atoms along here, hydrogen along here, you've only got one repelling action, which means you've just got one kink. As a result, the oil found in olives and almonds is called monounsaturated fatty acid. Mono referring to the fact there's only one double bond. 
unsaturated because there's still an empty spot on the fatty acid chain. And I think we can all appreciate olive oil is very thick oil. It's very thick oil because there's only one double bond in the fatty acid chain. What about coconut? Coconut is different. Coconut comprises of medium and short chain fatty acids. Medium chain would be not 18 chain, probably between 12 and 15 chain, and short chain would be between say 8 and 10 chains in the fatty acid chain. There are no double bonds in coconut, so every spot is full. So you've got hydrogen atoms all along, no double bonds at all. As a result, when it's cold, that oil is solid. So it's called a saturated fat. Which oil is the best? Which body function are you talking about? Because the body uses them all for different functions. So we need them all. But let me give you an illustration which I think illustrates how the body uses it. I used to work in an operating theatre in my 20s and I will give you an operating theatre scenario. Three double bonds from omega-3 is our surgeon. Two double bonds from the omega-6 that's our assisting physician. One double bond from omega-9 that's the theatre nurse. No double bonds that's the trolley boy. We had a trolley boy named Fred and he was very stocky and he was very strong and he was very good at lifting the patients because he was so strong and whenever you get an operation that might contain some pus then the theatre is considered infected theatre and it has to be scrubbed every tiny bit and no one was better at it than Fred. He was a very hard worker, very strong and we would say, Fred, it's time to take the patient into recovery. Fred would say, sure, bang, crash. And we'd be saying, Fred, 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 gentle, there's a person on there. Gentle, it was as if he didn't know what gentle meant. But he was a good trolley boy, but we just had to keep, <coughs> keep sort of tapering him down a little bit on his strength. Now, if the surgeon didn't turn up, would we put Fred on the job? No, no, they might lose a leg. Well, if Fred didn't turn up, would we put the surgeon on Fred's job? No, we wouldn't because he wasn't very strong and he had beautiful hands. Can you see my illustration? Every member of the team is very important. Every member of the team has their roles. When I was visiting my friend in Nakuru, Africa, she has an orphanage there. We took a little girl named Rahab. She had a big sore on her head to the hospital. We wanted her to be tested for AIDS. Now, the hospital had all of these buildings all separate, just fibro with corrugated iron roofs. And there were paths linking them. And there were lots of doctors with white coats and stethoscopes walking along the paths and nurses in their smart uniforms. And we went to the office, which was right in the middle of this huge complex. And when we got to the office, the window was on the outside. There was a terrible smell. I said to my friend, mate, What's that smell? She said, oh, it's the public toilets behind you. What is the use of the white coats and the stethoscope and the smart uniforms is that if there's a set of toilets in the middle of that complex that are just putrid? <laughs> I said to May, if I wasn't married, if I had no commitments, I'd come to this hospital and I'd apply to be the head cleaner. That hospital needed Florence Nightingale. You've got to clean up the place. The trolley boy, the cleaner, is a very important part of the team. It's like turning the tap off. So you see, every part of the team is very important because the body uses them for different things. Let me show you how the body uses them in the digestive breakdown because it's actually a totally different system with the different oils. Here is the stomach. First of all, we've got mouth. That's where digestion begins, in the mouth. Then we've got the esophagus coming down into the stomach. The stomach basically looks a little like this. Then we've got the liver. And underneath the liver, we've got the gallbladder. The gallbladder has a bile duct that comes down and it connects with the neck of the pancreas. So there's the pancreas. 
and it releases its enzymes into the duodenum. This is the pyloric sphincter. So this is the duodenum here. Your large intestine basically is here, but this small intestine travels down, weaves around here before finally it comes into the large intestine here. That's very simply how it all looks. Let's have a look at how these fats are broken down. Here is the villi. Now these villi line the gastrointestinal tract basically like that. Up in the middle of the villi is a lacteal, that's part of your lymphatic system. Over the lacteal is a capillary network. So let's have a look at these three long chain fatty acids. They come down into the stomach, they're not dealt with in the mouth, they're really not dealt with in the stomach. They come down into the duodenum and bile from the gallbladder breaks up the fat into tiny little particles. It's like emulsifies it. And then pancreatic lipase comes in and further breaks it down to glycerol and fatty acids. See what you've usually got is you've got a glycerol like this and you've got these fatty acids, there they are. These ones here, three of them all connected. Well those enzymes break them all apart and then they're absorbed into these little villi straight into the lacteal. The lacteal goes to the thymus, the thymus goes to the liver and the liver says, oh the surgeons have arrived. Store them to use for cell membrane function and repair. And then coconut comes down. Coconut is a medium and short chain fatty acid. It comes into the mouth and in the mouth is the tongue. And underneath the tongue there are little glands called sublingual glands and they release lingual lipase. And this lingual lipase breaks down medium and short chain fatty acids, no other. So coconut oil is actually started to be broken down in the mouth. And when you oil pull and put that coconut oil in your mouth, when that lingual lipase connects with the coconut oil, then it becomes antibacterial. As it is sitting there, the coconut oil is not antibacterial. But when it hits the lingual lipase and it starts to break this connection down, it releases the antibacterial properties. And when you put it on your skin, there are tiny enzymes in your skin that also convert it to antibacterial properties. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> As a result, coconut does not need bile. Coconut oil does not need pancreatic lipase. Coconut oil is absorbed straight into the bloodstream, taken to the liver and burnt as fuel. It's an amazing oil. Now ladies and gentlemen, if someone wanted to use an oil, sorry, if someone wanted to lose weight, would they eat an oil that the body burnt as fuel or would they eat an oil that the body stored? Burnt as fuel. If someone wanted to lose weight, what would be their oil of choice? It's difficult to say, isn't it? We've been so brainwashed against the poor old coconut. The coconut, it's the best weight loss oil there is. And if you wanted a high energy fuel, which oil would you eat? One that stored or one that burnt? The burning. See where the misconception has come from is people's understandings of calories. Glucose burns at four calories per gram. Fat burns at nine calories per gram. So when people want to lose weight, they say, I will not eat the fat. It's going to give me more than twice the calories that glucose will give me. But what they don't understand is what a calorie is. A calorie is a unit of energy. So if you want a high energy food, what are you going to eat? Fat. <laughs> Now if you eat more units of energy than you can burn, obviously the body will store it. That's why we should be eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, tea like a pauper. Best time to lose weight is while you're sleeping. Best time to be hungry is while you're sleeping, you don't even know. <laughs> it's the easiest way to do it. That's why your coconut cream is one of the best additives to your protein shakes, your protein smoothies.
give you high energy fuel. Coconut is 40% antifungal. It's a perfect food for that hot tropical environment where there's a lot of moisture and warmth, where fungus loves to grow. And it's a protection against fungal outbreaks in that environment. Coconut is very high in medium chain fatty acids. You might have seen that. There's your medium chain fatty acid. There's only one other food that's just as high and that's breast milk. So coconut milk is very similar to breast milk and there's another reason why it is so. Coconut is 48% lauric acid and lauric acid is a fatty acid that's antimicrobial. Butter is 2% lauric acid. But there's another food on the planet that contains lauric acid in good amounts and that's breast milk. So that's another reason why coconut milk is very similar to breast milk. Let's have a look at the planet, yeah? Would it be good for children um, to take, uh, say, a spoonful or a teaspoonful of coconut oil today, like just as like a medicinal uh, maintenance? Would it be good for children to make a tea take a teaspoon of coconut oil a day? Yes. <laughs> be great. Let's have a look at planet Earth. Here's mm -hmm. planet Earth. Here's the tropics. Of these foods, what food is grown in the tropics? The coconut. The coconut. And it's a perfect food for that environment. Mm -hmm. In Fiji, the green coconut juice is prized. They call it boo juice, B-U, boo juice. And the lining of the coconut in the immature coconut is very thin and it's like almost a soft white jelly. And when you drink the boo juice, it's just rich and beautiful, very high in minerals. But when the coconut gets old, then the lining gets really thick and dry and that's the coconut we know. And the, the milk in the middle doesn't have much properties in it at all. It's all gone into the thickness. <clears throat> and when I was teaching in Fiji, which I do every year, I said one year, I wouldn't be surprised if you could give a baby boo juice. Well, I had a few women run up to me after the meeting because they're very shy. And one lady said, my girlfriend was born on a far island in Fiji. She's 48 now. And her mother died in childbirth and there were no women on the island. So the men collected the boo juice, the green coconut every day and fed it to a newborn baby. And then some of the other ladies started to talk because they're very shy and they said, oh, traditionally all Fijian women give their babies boo juice. It's a beautiful milk for the baby. I was in Fiji in December and one of the guys I was with, he was saying, do you know there's a crisis in Fiji at the moment because the Fijian government will not allow them milk formula companies to put a happy Fijian baby face on the packet. So the milk companies in protest have stopped supplying and there's a crisis in Fiji, babies don't have milk to drink and they're getting it from Indonesia. And I said, well what about the boo juice? <laughs> the coconuts are rotting on the, on the ground. I said to my friend, and one of the guys is a doctor, I said, you need to write a letter to the newspaper. You're a doctor, you'll, you'll have say. <laughs> For those who need the magic of the MD, put that name at the bottom. Say, mothers, put your babies back on the boo juice. Because I tell you, those little Fijian babies are sick. They've got the thick, thick green coming out of their nose, they're chesty, they're the cow's milk babies. You see, cow's milk's good for cows, it's not good for human babies. The only way humans can really tolerate cow's milk is as yogurt or feta. And, that, and that's milk that's what the, cow's milk what the cow's stomach does to it. See, we don't have five stomachs. We've only got one. Let's go up to the Mediterranean. What foods are grown in the Mediterranean? Olives and the almonds. There's your omega-9. As you go up the planet, you'll find the foods grown further up, high in omega-6, 
right up the top, they're very high in omega-3. Udo Erasmus quoted research where a, where a plant grown here was tested and it was very high in omega-9. Same species of plant grown further up the planet, higher in omega-6. Same species of plant grown right up the top, higher in omega-3. In other words, we should be eating the food that's grown in our area because it's perfectly designed for our body's needs in that area, in that climate at that time of the year. When I lived up the top of Australia, I ate a lot of pawpaws. I never realised pawpaws could taste so nice off the tree. I had a lot of pineapples. And then for several years we, were, we lived down in the bottom of Victoria. I had a lot of apples down there, <laughs> a lot of stone fruit. It's best to... Now, down in, in uh, Melbourne in the middle of summer, sometimes we'd have a mango, but predominantly we ate the fruit that was eaten that, eat, grown in that area. You go into an Eskimo igloo in the, middle of sum, in the middle of winter, where you get the long, long winter nights and the short winter days, you'll hear a lot of laughter. There's no such thing as depression. Their electromagnetic field is sparky. They've absorbed their, what little vitamin D they get, they absorb it well, manage their heat, oxygen vitalizes and invigorates. What are they eating? A lot of seal, a lot of fish. And that fish and that seal is very, very high in omega-3 because the seaweeds are very high in omega-3 and that's what they're eating. I think if I went and lived with the Eskimos, I'd just take a big bunch of chia seed. <laughs> But you know, Rasmus tells the story of a man who went to live there and stayed on his sad diet. You've heard of the sad diet? Standard Australian diet, very sad. Standard American diet, very sad. The sad diet. And after two months, he became very, very sad to the point where they had to fly him out. He was getting depressed, even suicidal. He was totally deficient in omega-3. And you know the sad, there, there is a condition called the SAD disease that's happening in the, in the European countries that are further up the planet. They've stopped eating their traditional diet. There's never been a lot of sun. It's not the sun. It's actually what they're eating that is causing the sadness. It's the deficiency in the, in the, uh, in the omega-3s. The question often arises... How are we going to get our calcium? Because I think we've definitely assessed the protein. Well, what about the calcium? What are we told is the highest source of calcium? Milk. Glass of milk. Probably is for the cow. But humans can't access that calcium. It's very high in animal protein and very high in calcium is a glass of cow's milk. But that protein is animal protein and it's very dirty burning fuel. Only 58% is burnt as fuel in animal protein. 58% is fuel. That leaves a 42% waste. And that waste is a sulfur waste and it's very acidic. And so what the body does is it uses the most alkaline mineral. Do you remember students, your most alkaline mineral? It's calcium. It uses the calcium in the milk to negate that sulfur acidic residue from metabolizing the protein. How much calcium is now left for the body? None. The countries in this world that consume the greatest amounts of dairy products have the highest incidence of osteoporosis. And the countries in this world that don't consume the dairy, or hardly any, they don't have osteoporosis. Because if someone has a glass of milk and a steak, there's not enough calcium in the milk to negate the sulfur residue from the steak. So where is the calcium taken from now? From the bones. Osteoporosis is basically epidemic proportions in Australia today. And osteoporosis is happening because People are eating a diet high in acid-forming things, leaching the calcium out of the bones. They're not exercising. Tomorrow we'll look at exercise. You've got to exercise those bones just as much as the muscles. 
Hormonal imbalance, remember in the hormone lecture I said progesterone stimulates bone building cells. So many women who've been on the pill get osteoporosis because of those high estrogen levels, which displaces the progesterone. Where are we going to get our calcium from? We can get it where the orangutans and the elephants and the giraffes, where do they get their calcium from? Where does the cow get its calcium? Dark, green, leafy vegetables. We don't have to eat grass. We can have rocket and coriander and lettuce and kale and lots of dark green leafy vegetables. Soy. Soy is very high in calcium. Chickpeas. They're quite high in calcium. They're the two highest in the legume department. But the highest is sesame seed. Sesame seed is something like, I think, 1,400 milligrams per cup of sesame seeds. Now, you're not going to eat a cup of sesame seed, but hey, very high, higher than any dairy product. And an easy way to have sesame seed is tahini. And tahini lasts a long time because it has an antioxidant in it called sesamol, which prevents it going rancid. And, and hummus is a very nice way to eat your chickpea and your tahini. Also baba gamush, falafels, a lot of Lebanese food combines the chickpeas and the tahini. So when the children come home from school, instead of giving them a glass of milk, have a platter of raw veggies and a bowl of hummus. I get a lot more <laughs> calcium there. And when they've polished off the raw veggies and hummus, you can say, they'll say, we're finished. And you can say, oh, good, here are the baked potatoes and the lentil stew <laughs> and the sourdough bread. Because the kid's hungry when they come home from school. It's the Pope of Catholic, they're starving. <laughs> it's a good time to eat them. Good time to feed them. <laughs> And a lot of mothers have told me that that works so well is to feed the children the main meal then because that's when they're very hungry. Most people are having too many acid forming, remember the acid side, too much meat and dairy, too much of your caffeines, too much of your alcohols which leach the calcium out because of the high acid they create. Most Aussies don't exercise. Most women have a hormonal imbalance. No wonder osteoporosis is out of control and the milk won't fix it. So you look at your Hunsas living in, your, in the Himalayan mountains. They have no doctor, no nurse, no hospital, no police, no jail. They play, you know, that's where polo um, originated. They play polo, sometimes falls, someone falls off a horse. They heal very quickly. No broken bones. And they don't drink milk. They have meat about three times a year on festive occasions. And they have a little sheep's yogurt some days. Where are they getting their calcium? You know, look how big the cow's bones are and he's not drinking milk. <laughs> They're getting it from grass. So those green leafies are very, very high. When I was at school, in my common sense cookery class, we had a book, the common sense cookbook. It had a triangle in it. And the triangle stated that we should be eating a lot of meat and dairy products. And then we should be eating quite a lot of grains. And we should include a few fruit and veg. And the smallest amount would be the fats and sugars. That was when I, maybe in the 60s when I was at school. In about the 80s, they changed the triangle. They changed the triangle because of heart disease being the number one killer. So on the bottom, they put grains. A lot of research came out about the phytochemicals, the healing properties in fruit and vegetables. So fruit and vegetables were encouraged even more. And meat and dairy 
because it was acknowledged the harm in the animal fats that went up a little bit higher and the fats and sugars stayed up the top. In many nutrition books today, you will still see that triangle. But what's that done for Aussies? Here it is over here. That's another reason why Aussies are having their high carbohydrate diet. This high carbohydrate releasing this high glucose is wearing out the pancreas, 400 diabetics diagnosed daily in Australia. It's produced a nation with 62% overweight. Just have a look at flood scenes, you know, scenes in the, on the television and look at the crowd scenes. What are the size of the people? They're big. <laughs> They're very big. It's also causing cancer to be neck and neck with heart disease. Your, um, what was brought on the scene? Margarine. Margarine was brought on the scene in about the 70s, I think, because of heart disease. They said it's the butter that's making the thick clogging up the arteries. But did you know the Frenchmen love their butter and they don't get the, the cholesterol problems? How do you make margarine? It's a bit scary. Let's say we're going to make margarine out of uh, some flaxseed oil. Well, it's liquid. That's the problem. So we have to make it solid. So they saturate. They saturate it with hydrogen ions. And what that does is that causes this hydrogen ion to kick over to the other side. So we've got a hydrogen ion up here now. The double bond's gone. The electromagnetic field's gone. And now the oil is straight. Now the person can spread it on their bread. But that structure that I've drawn for you there is not known in nature. It's one molecular structure short of plastic. So if a person eats margarine, they really should eat the container it comes in because that's how close it is. What about the ones with the FDA tick on it? What about it? I'll leave that up to your imagination. Every tub of margarine is a saturated fat because if it was polyunsaturated, you'd open it and it would be liquid. That's the polyunsaturated that is the saturated. Well, why do they say polyunsaturated margarine? Because it was polyunsaturated before they saturated it. It is so destroyed and so deficient in anything that can be called nutrient that it can sit on the bench for 10 years and not deteriorate. That's scary, isn't it? Skin cancer rates have risen since margarine came on because the body sees it as an enemy. It says, who's this? I don't know what to do with this. So it releases it as quickly as possible out of the skin. There's your skin cancer rates going up. Heart disease has not dropped since margarine came on the scene. So what should be the triangle? What should be on the bottom of the triangle? Vegetables. No limit on the vegetables. Fruit, for some people, the fruit can equal the vegetables, but for some people, what people should limit the vegetables? Sorry, no one. What, what people should limit the fruit? People that are conquering cancer, people that have a yeast condition in their body, people that are diabetic, people that want to lose weight, they need to reduce that fruit right down. Legumes. We need to revive the legume. Seeds. And notice where I put grains up the top. Now this middle section, that can be played with a bit. I'm sure my boys, with all their hard work, can put grain down a little bit further. And up the top, we've got our oils, we've got maple syrup, we've got honey, we've got nuts. Beautiful food, but they're concentrated foods. And they should only be taken in a small amount. Let's have a look at that triangle through several windows. Let's look at it through the pH window. Does it get a tick on the pH window? Yeah, because your vegetables are your most alkaline, the most acid are up the top. It's a tick. Let's have a look at that through the liver window. Does it get a tick through the liver? 
What does the liver need? A lot of beta carotenes found in your orange and your green coloured vegetables. It needs the proteins which are here and the good fats. It gets a tick from the liver window. What about the colon? Let's have a look at it through the colon window. Colon needs to be swept every day. What's your highest fibre food? Vegetables. Gets a tick. Let's have a look at it through the uh, cancer window. Cancer's favourite food is sugar. What should we be eating? A lot of vegetables. We need the proteins to help the liver detox and recover from cancer. It gets a tick from the cancer window. What about availability? There's always fresh fruit and vegetables available, isn't there? There's always fresh vegetables available. When I started gardening at the age of 30 in my rainforest home, I, I thought you can't grow lettuce in the winter because we got big frosts. Well, there were some lettuce not quite ready, so I let them go. They'd frost over and by 11 in the morning, they were beautiful. I found out that lettuce is a winter crop because in the summer it bolts. So vegetables are always available. So availability gets a tick. What about cost? How much do you get for $50 in the fruit and veggie shop compared to how much you get for $50 in the health food shop? <laughs> And it's not easy to make olive oil or grow nuts or make honey or maple syrup, but I tell you, it's very easy to grow vegetables. <laughs> very easy. So cost and availability. No matter what window we look at that triangle through, it gets a tick. On my website, Barb Health, there's another two articles you can download. They're entitled, How to Show Respect to the Delicate Organs of Digestion, Part 1, the Stomach, and Part 2, the Colon. And it's got basic principles to look after stomach and colon. And a graphic designer did me a triangle. And in that triangle, he drew all the vegetables, and then the legumes and the grains. So you can scan it, blow it up, colour it in, put it on your fridge. <laughs> Colouring in for the children. Yeah, it gives a beautiful illustration. He did it beautifully, you know, the plants are sort of overflowing out of the triangle. I noticed Eudo Erasmus on his website, this is his triangle now. My son James told me, yeah, this is the bodybuilder's triangle now. Because this triangle is not working. It's not working. What I endeavoured to do this morning was give you some illustrations so it's not hard for you to work out for yourself what is the best food for human beings. And the best food for human beings is the most freely available. If I said for breakfast this morning, let's go to the garden, and hopefully when you come back next year, we'll do that. <laughs> There'll be a big garden happening. We found out where the floods won't go and you are hungry. You had broth for tea last night. Howard took you on a mighty walk this morning and you are ready to eat. And, I, and you go into the garden. What would you have in your mouth in minutes? I think I'd be under the cherry tree. Your fresh fruit and vegetables, that's the easily available. It might be when, like William, when he was a little bloke, I'd go out into the rainforest on my veranda, lunchtime, cooey, you know, the cooey call. Amazing, I've got six kids, it's been five, six hours since they've eaten and they're not pulling up my skirt. That's because they drink lots of water between meals and they have meals that are high in fibre, substantial protein, sufficient fat. Well, kids would jump out of trees, jump out of the creeks, all come running, we'd all sit down and we're just about to start eating. Where's William? He was the littlest bloke, quite little bloke. And I'd look at James, he knew where to go, cucumber patch. And there he'd be sitting, chomping on a cucumber. He'd got a little bit hungry and mum hadn't called yet, so he'd go and sit in the cucumber patch. For people that can't have the fruit, 
Fast food for them might be cucumbers, they might be carrots, they might be tomatoes, avocados. I put my husband Michael on the strict diet one day of no fruit for six weeks. He had a problem that I wanted conquered. I said, six weeks. He was in town one day and he said, I'm hungry, I'm not going to get home for lunch, what will I do? I said, buy a couple of carrots and a little bag of macadamia nuts, <laughs> chomp on them and I'll have a nice big veggie soup for you tonight for tea. <laughs> See, people say, what can you do when you travel? I, well, we're, we hit America oh, late one night. We stayed in the airport motel the night and then the next morning we had to travel and we were getting to the health retreat we were going to to run for lunch. So we just traveled until we found a big supermarket and we went in and we bought a few selections of fruit and a couple of little bags of nuts. I tell you, it's fast food, isn't it? At least in Australia, you can get baked beans. You can't even get that, you know, at a, like a restaurant for breakfast. In America, all you get is white bread, margarine and eggs and lots of fried foods. <laughs> so we know we're not going to even go into there. But because he was on the low sweet diet, I thought he can get a couple of carrots, a little bag of macadamia nuts. That'll keep the hunger pangs at bay and then... When he gets home, I'll have a veggie soup for him that night. So it's good to look at your options. It's good to look at no matter where you are. People say, it's all right when you're up here. Look at, look at where you live and how you live. It's easy. I said, yes, it is easy. <laughs> but I said, we travel too. We have lots of friends and relatives who don't eat as we do. And uh, there's always something you can do. I was staying at a friend's house and I was looking at the food they were eating and it was just high carb, high carb, all refined. And I said, I've got a little bit of salad in the car. Do you want me to make a salad? She said, oh, all right. In other words, there wasn't going to be a salad. <laughs> oh, I just happened to have a jar of olives. I tell you, olives are easy, aren't they? So we had a big salad. So we're able to do that. And as you've found, it doesn't matter if some meals, it's very light. The, bo the body survives. Thank you for attention this morning. Tomorrow, we're going to be looking at three very important subjects exercise, water and salt. So we will cover those in our next lecture.